Well, I'm excited to be with you today. We had our, our fall kickoff last week. It's a time of high energy. It's a time of coming together and being in this place, coming as we are. This is good news for us. And in our new sermon series called This Is Us, we're focusing on the difficulty of and also the need for relationships and how God continues to use relationships in our lives to meet needs, even when we don't necessarily live into those expectations fully ourselves. Now, as we start to look about the things that we are coming around in this place, I think it's important for us to look back, to look at the scriptures, to be able to name the things that are central to what we believe. And so we're going to start in the beginning. We're starting with Genesis. And if we're going to start with the beginning in Genesis, we might as well have God usher us in. So here is the voice of God. There are billions of us on this planet. It's hard to believe we all came from one man and one woman. But we did. Who were they? When and where did they live? Jewish, Christian, and Muslim traditions trace us all back to Adam and Eve. The book of Genesis says they came from a place called Eden near the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, somewhere in the ancient Near East. No one has yet found the location of the Garden of Eden, though many have tried. But why do we want to find it? Well, the reason is interesting. The Garden of Eden doesn't just represent the beginning of humanity. It is the beginning of our conversation with God. And finding out when and where that took place would tell us an awful lot about who we are. I love one of those final quotes that Morgan Freeman lifted up. The creation story is the beginning of our conversation with God. For us to be able to have this initial interaction, I think it's important for us to be able to name who is God in our lives. What has God done on behalf of ourselves? And who are we? We're beloved children of God, but so is our neighbors. So how do we view our neighbors? How do we connect with them in meaningful ways? And how do we draw closer together as the church? I think even more importantly, how do we leave this place as the church to make a difference in the world that God created and loves? Now, each and every person here in this space today, we each have a story. And the more that our story starts to blend with others, the more complicated it gets. But the more that our story overlaps, I think the more opportunity we also have to experience the things that God desires for creation. And the things that God desires for creation don't always match up with the things that creation desires. Think on that for a moment. The things that God desires for creation don't always match up with the things that creation desires. Now, it was a long preaching text today, but Genesis 3, it names this. Literally since a few days into the beginning of time, if you will, this has always been the reality. We don't always do what God expects of us. And if I can be honest with you, this brings me a whole lot of comfort and also a little bit of uneasiness as well. Because in one way, I have something in my back pocket. The reality that, hey, I'm a sinner. I'm broken. My ancestors our ancestors, we all couldn't quite live up to God's expectations. I'm not the only one. That makes me feel a little bit better about myself. But as you look at these stories of Adam and Eve and, and other folks within the scriptures, we're reminded time and time again that they, we lead each other astray. There's times where we pass blame on to each other. We find ourselves both on the journey forward and we find ourselves in a similar, similar position to Adam and Eve today. In our preaching text, it says that God gave clear expectations of his creation. Enjoy all of this other stuff, but don't eat that. Seriously, anything else, it's all yours. But that, I'm, I'm serious, don't do it. The reality is, we couldn't help ourselves. Adam and Eve couldn't. I think that that's how we are with sin as well. If I can be honest with you, I think it's a little strange to imagine a conversation with a snake. But the folks that were hearing this and reading this for the first time, they were okay with it. So I'm going to roll with it this morning. 
In our preaching text, we saw this exchange taking place. We saw the serpent. We hear Eve's response. And the serpent already knows the answer to the question that's being asked. And Eve does as well, so she answers truthfully. But the serpent is sly. And he tells Eve that she won't die because God knows that her eyes will be opened and she'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, on face value, this might not seem like such a bad deal, but their eyes were indeed opened. They experienced shame for the first time. There's a whole lot of firsts that are coming here. For the first time, humanity sinned. We found ourselves with something in between us and God for the first time. And I wonder, when did you experience shame for the first time? When did you experience sin, either on the giving or the receiving end? Where were you when your eyes were first opened? Now, God engages Adam and Eve in our text today, and God looks for Adam and Eve. But they both decide that it's better for them to hide than to engage God one-on-one. And I wonder, how many times do you find yourself in a similar boat where you feel as though you've done something so bad that God couldn't possibly come to you, have conversation with you, extend mercy to you? How often do you feel that way? As though you've done something so bad that God isn't going to love you anymore. I think this is a difficult thing, but all of us worry about this a bit. I know that we feel as though maybe the brokenness in our lives somehow disqualifies us from being able to experience God's mercies. When we hear that some things might make us scratch our heads a bit too in our, in our text today. Now, I don't want us to get lost by this long preaching text. I think what God is trying to get to us And that's mercy. It's covering us with mercy time and time again. In fact, in our scripture today, that's what it says happens. God clothed them. And it might seem as though maybe God is trying to right a wrong because they're naked. And if if that's what we're going to focus on, then so be it. We don't need to take this literally. But what I am experiencing today is truly mercy. All too often, I see us coming out of our cars, coming into this place, and feeling like we have to have it all together. We've got great greeters at the door. They have a smile on their face. We feel as though we have to duplicate that. We have to have a smile on our face as well. We have to pretend we have it all together. But we don't. When we come into this place, we're able to lift up whatever it is that's on our shoulders weighing us down. And we too are able to experience mercy, to experience forgiveness. You see, in the story of Adam and Eve, God is literally clothing them with mercy. God is taking something that he knows Adam and Eve can't do by themselves and is covering them. It's literally the first time that God has their back. God has our back today as well. Now, in this sense, clothing is an act of mercy for covering up shame. I want you to be able to think about what that is for your life how you can take this and have it be not just something that took place in the book of Genesis, but something that is for us as individuals, for us as families, for us as the body of Christ. Too often, I think, in our lives, there's things that get in the way of us being real. I go home and I flip on the news and and I see a lot of brokenness in the world. I feel as though it's not something that I want to weigh me down, so I start to flip channels a bit. Normally, I find myself watching HGTV. Maybe you find yourself there as well. And I get excited because I I try to be creative. But I also then start to doubt myself. I start to feel down about my abilities, my assets. Every single time I watch the show, there's always this couple, and they make like 20 grand a year, and they have a $500,000 budget. And they're buying this brand new house Or they're knocking down walls and putting in the dream kitchen. I watch this and I I feel bad about myself. I start to covet what my neighbors have, what these folks have. I start to try to dream in ways that probably aren't realistic for myself. And so once I start feeling bad about that, I, I flip the channel a few more, date night at home with my wife. We start watching the Hallmark Channel. An hour and a half in, this is always what happens, the plane's starting to land, right? 
I'm looking at the clock going, there's no way it's going to come together. But it always does. No matter what was getting in the way of their life in those moments, everything is forgiven. Everything is figured out. The snow starts to fall. They kiss. Hour and a half. Done. Every single time. The reality is, my family is not like that. I go to bed sometimes wishing that we could have talked more about the thing that was bothering us today, about my kid that's driving me crazy, and how sometimes I don't live up to those expectations as a partner. We watch these television shows to try to lift us up, and sometimes they let us down a bit. But there is one show, one show that I think speaks truthfully to what we experience, and it's this one right here. Saying I do means saying I will. I need you to help me, please. Are you laying down, Jack? Big three? Big three! I watch football with my dad. I'd like to meet him sometime. Okay. I know it's gonna be a little creepy. This is your dad? Lucky cat. You are the reason I've been waiting all these years. You had a breakdown. I'm okay. My father didn't have a lot of time left. And he'd very much like to show me where he's from. Take good care of you, too. I'll send you a postcard. <laughs> I want you to picture the love of your life. Imagine that you have one shot to win her back. The best thing that ever happened to me was you telling me that you'd marry me. I'm still in love with you. Uh, Kate, can I get one right here? Kate, right here. What are you doing? Give me just one day where you're the star. Man, that was a hell of a thing you did. Adam hid, and he blamed his better half. Eve trusted the wrong people. Jack struggled with alcoholism. Rebecca struggles with judgment. Kate struggled with infertility and eating disorders. Randall struggles with being adopted and anxiety. Kevin just wants to be taken seriously. William, he wants a redo with time running out. Toby wants to feel normal. Beth does, too. What's your worry today? You see, we're invited into this place because all of us are fixer-uppers. All of us need Christmas in July and August and September and every month because it's what Christ did coming from being a baby to dying on the cross, showing us the way. Adam and Eve, they couldn't do it on their own. And we can't either. We're all in need of God's mercy. We're all in need of God's forgiveness, of being clothed, of experiencing grace. I hope and pray this year at Good Shepherd that we can come together, be fully ourselves, and experience mercy right here. This is us. You have a place here. Amen. <laughs>